Well, it's a presentation on Chapter 3. Uh, the chapter uh, that we're covering today is going to cover issues of contract liability and tort liability for employers, and especially how those react to their relationship with their employees and sometimes with third parties. I'm not going to attempt to cover the entire um, chapter in this presentation, in this Limba. Um, I will try to do a few separate ones so it's a little bit more manageable amount of material to cover, but I did want to get started on this material. So I'm going to go to our next slide. Employment at will. This is one, in my experience, one of the uh, aspects of American employment law that is most surprising to lay people. Uh, there is a fundamental belief in the population generally that you can't be fired unless you did something wrong. Um, there's the, the notion that exists there has to be just cause for termination. But the reality is is that in the, in the majority, in fact the vast majority of situations, an employer has no obligation to show that it acted um, with just cause, that it had a, a, a reason for terminating that others would say, yeah, that's a good reason. You were perfectly justified in what you did. That is not the ordinary legal standard in the United States. Now, there are some exceptions. First, I'm going to talk about the exceptions before I actually talk about the policy. Well, first is if the employee and the employer have an employment contract that provides for something other than at-will employment. And I would say most employment contracts do provide for um, something other than that moment. And we'll talk about what that might be later on. But the reality is very few um, employees have individual employment contracts. Usually they're restricted to um, government employees in certain capacities. I'm thinking specifically of teachers or executives in corporations. Those are the main categories of folks who have employment contracts. Uh, if you're a, an ordinary wage earner out there in America, the odds of you having an employment contract are very, very small, unless you're covered by an, a, a union contract. In that situation, um, under those circumstances, you might well find yourself covered by something other than employment at will. Most of the time, the union contracts, which are called collective bargaining agreements, provide for something other than at will employment. Um, also, just general government work, even if the employee, the government employee, does not have an employment contract, um, there are uh, constitutional and other issues that can sometimes cause that employment relationship to involve things called property rights. Um, so we've talked about discrete employment contracts, we've talked about union contracts, we've talked about government employment. Now, we have a whole section in this textbook about um, union situations, which we'll spend um, at least one class on. I'd love to spend more, but we might just get one class on. And the reason why we don't spend a lot of time on that topic is that there just isn't that much unionization in this part of the country. Um, and so it's not something that most of you as practitioners of employment law will see a lot of. And if you go to work for American Airlines or Southwest Airlines um, or uh, some other highly unionized enterprise, um, you will find that you will want more labor and knowledge and, and more labor expertise, but that's not the, the usual order of business in the Dallas Forward area. So I don't spend a lot of time on that topic, but I'm kind of carving that out for the rest of the discussion. And I think I said the first class that I don't spend a lot of time on government employment. Um, there are lots of issues that arise when you're employed by government, the federal government or the state government or some um, um, offshoot of those, those entities that sometimes give workers more rights or different rights than private employment. Um, but this, as you'll discover as we go forward, I'm, we're going to cover so many different topics. Um, there's just some things we have to say we're not going to do a lot on. And that's one thing we're not. We're not going to spend a lot of time with public employment. Um, the textbook covers it to some extent, and we will kind of graze the topic, but I'm not going to do a deep dive simply because time doesn't permit. Certainly an important topic, a large portion of Americans do work for the federal or state government in some capacity, so it's certainly not a small part of the population, but certainly compared with the private sector, it is smaller. So we've talked about this topic, about a fixed term or definite term. That's not going to involve employment at will. 
um, we, we, let's talk about these other three categories. And that is when they're, um, well, I guess this is uh, analogous to this. And when there's an express or implied contract, permits termination only for cause. And the interesting word here is imply. There are some situations where some courts have implied a contractual relationship um, in which uh, you, you can only terminate for cause. Um, the, the jurisdictions that that occur, and, and that's very, well, that, the jurisdictions that have used those arguments are not Texas. Um, I will tell you that right now, um, those are not uh, making, making an allegation. There's an implied contract that moves us out of the at-will employment area is, is l- unlikely to be a winning argument in Texas. If you move to another jurisdiction, you very possibly will be more successful with that, although still it is a minority view that um, the parties can kind of stumble into a contract relationship that's different than at will. There are also judicial exceptions, and we will talk about this one. There is one relevant one in Texas about this. It's called Sabine Pilot, um, and we'll talk about that um, as we go forward in the course. But um, um, it's an important case. It's an important topic. But uh, the odds of you actually getting a case with the beam pilot implication not so likely. Um, realistically, it's not a. It's a very narrow exception. So judicial made exceptions in our jurisdiction are pretty small and and uh, pretty narrowly drafted. Now, if we were in California and New York and some other jurisdiction, there's a lot more activity in those areas. So. Um, if you practice in these other locations, you may find additional activity. Or if you represent Texas companies that do business in those locations, you may find that, that those precedents have more significance. There's also something called an implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. This really is very much connected to this judicially made exception. Actually, more, I'm sorry. No, it's not tied to that. It's tied to the implied contract. Um, that category. And you'll find, particularly in California, that this is an idea that has some staying power. Again, Texas courts are very impressed by this. So, um, about the only way that that a plaintiff is likely to be successful with an exception to the at-will doctrine is when there's an employment contract. And again, that employment contract may be in a union situation or an individual employment contract. Other than that, probably your student is going to be employment at will. So, what hopefully you've concluded this point is, and eh, there's a 99% chance I'm employed at will. So let's look at what that means. Um, this is a pretty good definition of what it means. Employment can be terminated at any time without notice by either the employer or the employee. It's an equal opportunity policy. Having said that, it doesn't feel that way. Um, the idea that the employee can leave at any time can leave his, his place of employment at any time for any reason seems very intuitive. Well, of course, you can quit when you aren't happy. There are other ways you couldn't quit. That would be like slavery, right? The 13th Amendment prohibits that. So I ought to be able to quit my employment at any time, and I ought not have to justify and say, well, my, my boss is being mean to me. I can just simply say I got a better opportunity. They were plenty nice to me in my old place, but uh, things are slightly better in my new place, and that's where I'm going to go. So um, most people have an intuitive recognition that employment at will should exist on the part of the employee. But the other side of that coin is a little bit less um, intuitive, a little bit seems a little bit less uh, fair for many people. And that is the notion that the employer has an equal right. The employer can at any time say, this is just not what we want going forward. The employer does not need to present a reason the employer does not need to have a reason. The employer does not need to give notice or give any kind of severance benefits under those circumstances. An employer could go into work, um, or the boss could go into work on Monday morning, um, call everyone into the office and, and say, you know what, I'm terminating everyone who's born in January just because I don't like January babies. It's irrational. It makes no sense. Would it be unlawful? No. It would be perfectly lawful if that were the real reason the employer were doing it. Now, of course, if the employer had looked up everyone's birthday beforehand and said, oh, I really don't like Bob. Oh, he's a January baby. Well, I don't really have a good reason to fire Bob, so I'm just going to say it's because he's a January baby. Well, then that's not the real reason that the employer was terminating January babies, because they're babies. He's using it as a cover story, as an ex- a false explanation for why he's terminating Bob. But if the employer really did fire people because of the month they were born or because of the 
color of the shirt they wore that morning to, to work, that would be a bizarre reason, that would be a foolish reason, that would be a strange reason, but it would not be an unlawful reason. And while we would all sympathize with that employee and say, that's just not fair, that employee, assuming that the, the employer's reason, that the jury believes the employer has provided a reason, the employee would have no recourse regarding that. Now, I said that this, this rule in some sense seems fair when you hear it because the employee can leave at any time. The employer can send the employee home at any time. But our reaction to the fairness is a little bit different because the reality is if, if you're a pretty large operation, you lose an employee and you're the employer. I mean, it's no big deal. It's inconvenient. You have to put another ad in the paper. You've got to train somebody. I mean, yes, it's, it's a hassle, but the operation goes on. Pretty much everything's the same. But, of course, for the employee who's been terminated, it's huge. And this person um, has no income suddenly. This person has no place to go that day. There's a feeling of loss of purpose, uh, embarrassment, uncertainty. Um, this is perhaps going to affect his, his credentials, his resume, for years and years to come. Because the question is going to be, why did you leave that employer? Well, they fired me. Uh, and, and, and even if the employer did have a bizarre and reasonable reason, then the person where you're interviewing, if you're that employee, is going to assume, hey, yeah, probably that employer had a good reason. Most of the time when you fire somebody, you got a good reason. So um, it seems unfair because the effect upon the employee of the employer's action is so negative and so big, whereas the employee's action with respect to the employer seems yeah, not that big of a deal. But even though it doesn't seem to us on an emotional level to be um, equivalent um, actions from a legal standpoint, they are. So another point of confusion can be that um, there's this whole idea of, well, you've got to give two weeks notice. Okay. Let me first of all begin by saying two weeks notice is a really good idea to give if you're an employee. It is going to pay dividends for you big time in your career. Having said that, the employee is under no requirement to give two weeks notice or even two minutes notice. And under the employment at will doctrine, the employee can say, I'm done. And clock out, I'm done. You have to clock out, leave. And at the moment that they cross the threshold, um, then they cease to be an employee if that's how they ended the employment relationship. But they're entitled to pay up until that last moment of productivity. So I said, you don't have to give two weeks notice or even two minutes notice. But, it's smart too. And the reason for this is, is several fold. The, the big one is that what kind of reference is your, um, that place of employment likely to give you if you don't give any notice? Um, if you don't give notice, um, then they're very likely to give you a poor reference. Well, if they give you a poor reference, it's going to very likely be difficult for you to get another position. Or at a minimum, you're going to have a question mark about that. Um, even if there's not an official um, reference call that's made, you're in a small enough community, your reputation may be um, affected by that. Um, I remember I was once in a meeting where uh, the general counsel of the organization where I worked at the time talked about an attorney um, uh, that this person particularly respected because of a decision that they made that was a, kind of a daring decision. Anyway, at the end of the remark, the general counsel said, of course, when this person left, he didn't give any notice. And um, it was very clear, and, and would have been very clear to, to most legal professionals, that that is just not okay to do. Um, the only times that it might be okay to do would be if there's an, an ethical issue that's come up that you find it unacceptable to continue to work there. Um, you know, that's probably the most likely situation where that, that would come up. Um, in that situation, though, you may think, well, that's, that's, that could just be with a good out. But it really doesn't because very likely if it's an ethical situation, you're going to be bound by attorney-client privilege not to uh, reveal any of the information. You could say there was a, an ethical issue. I was uncomfortable continuing my employment there. And that it might be an adequate explanation. But if it's a local law firm, then you might be talking to somebody who's friends with the people of that old law firm. And so you might have just insulted um, a friend of the person where you're interviewing. So, so it's a complicated issue. Yeah, the, the, the takeaway is if you can at all give two weeks notice, and I will tell you, especially for attorneys, two weeks is really not considered enough. 
Yes, if you have another job and you have to be there in two weeks, that's considered okay. But more, it's more common to give a month's notice, and um, if you can pull that off. And after, when I left Penny's, um, I actually gave notice several months in advance. Of course, I had this job, and I didn't have to start until August, but I gave them several months' notice. The reality is it takes quite a while to find um, an attorney to replace you. You're going to have to you know, put a lot of ads, do a lot of interviews, take a lot of time, and then you're going to have to give that person time to make the transition to the next place. So um, for an attorney, I would say you really ought to try for four weeks if at all possible. Um, for a paralegal, a minimum of two weeks. But if you could give three, that would be um, very likely to, to uh, preserve your, your good reputation in that new place of employment. Okay, um, I have a bullet here that I haven't talked about, and that is the issue of mass layoffs. We'll be talking about the WARN Act. Um, WARN is W-A-R-N-E. That's the name of the law. There's no E, I'm sorry. W-A-R-N. And it stands for Worker Adjustment and... and huh. What is the issue? And Reduction Enforcement. I'm not sure what it stands for, actually. But what is the layoff law? The mass layoff law. Um, in that law... Uh, there are provisions that the employer must give the laid-off workers 60 days notice. There are some exceptions to that rule. It's not, it doesn't apply in every single circumstance. And we, when we get to the Warren Act, we'll talk more about that. But that is one exception to the, to the general rule that the employer does not have to give notice. Um, again, it only applies in mass layoff situations, and it doesn't even apply in all those circumstances. So. It's not going to cover the garden variety situation where somebody's being terminated. Um, and it really doesn't apply to situations where the employee or is it terminating the employee because it's some perceived performance deficit or misconduct or something along those lines. So yeah, that's the doctrine of employment at will. Um, and as you practice, you will find, especially if you're on the plaintiff side, that this is not going to be what the employee, the, the, the potential plaintiff who walks into your office is thinking. Um, he or she will be persuaded that they were done wrong, that there was a violation of the law simply because it wasn't fair. And so one of the things that you will find is you have to acquaint uh, your potential client with what the actual standard is, and um, that they won't come to the table with that. You'll even find that sometimes on the employer side. Let's talk about Rooney versus Tyson. Now, this is a quirky case. Um, the textbook includes it, I think, because it's a case of Mike Tyson, so it has some... Um, interest, kind of like they included that Janet Jackson, Justin Timberlake case. It has some level of, of interest. I'm not persuaded that a Texas court would decide this case in exactly the way that this New York um, opinion came down, um, but it's an interesting exploration of the issue. So that's, I think, the takeaway. So what is the issue? If the length of an oral contract is for as long as Tyson fought professionally, is that definite enough to be enforced, or is it one of at-will employment? Pause here and, and uh, kind of clarify a term here. Most written contracts, employment contracts, are going to include provisions that say what will happen if the relationship isn't working out. How can the two parties part company what are the, uh, the expectations of each of these parties? So when you're dealing with an oral contract, um, you know, we call it a contract, but the parties making it were uh, probably not thinking in very legalistic terms. They were, um, things were going along well. People were happy with one another. They were planning for all kinds of success and wonderful things. And they weren't really thinking about, well, let's plan out what's going to happen when we start hating one another. Um, that's just not the way people think. It's the way lawyers think, it's the way paralegals think, but it's not the way you know normal people think. So they hadn't anticipated it. So one of the issues that the court is trying to contend with is trying to figure out what these parties meant about a, a turn of events that really they didn't mean anything about. They hadn't thought about this. They weren't that focusing that way. If so, let's go into a fantasy world where... Um, Tyson and, and, and the people involved in this really did sit down and think about the different scenarios and really did think, well, what if this goes wrong? What if this goes wrong? Well, what happens here? And they had really wrestled with those issues and come up with a decision. Um, well, were they planning for kind of an at-will employment relationship or were they planning for something 
um, a little bit different one that, that that the terms were more established. And it really all turns on this kind of idea they had for as long as Tyson fought professionally. If that's definite enough, if that's precise enough, then you, you have a contract that has a definite term and it's no longer at will employment. Um, so let's say that all a professional boxer at most is going to practice his profession for 12 months. That there is a law that says, well, after 12 months, you can't <coughs> be a professional um, box that's that way. Well, we'd all agree that was for a pretty definite time. Um, but that's, of course, not the reality. There are, are uh, uh, boxers like uh, uh, Muhammad Ali and George Foreman who box for a really long time. And then there are some who box for a lot less time. So um, some people could... <coughs> that it is definite enough, some would say, well, no, it's not definite enough. And part of this case turns upon some course of facts. For those of y'all that don't remember Mike Tyson, he was a boxer who came from a troubled background and he continued to have a lot of personal challenges along the way. So here we are in 1980. He's 14 years old. He is, um, I guess, a really awesome prospect. Although he's still certainly a young man, it's more of a kid than a grown-up at this point. And so he is, uh, associates with uh, D'Amato, apparently a very well-regarded, successful boxing person. This, I'm sure from um, uh, the teenage Mike perspective, this was quite a coup, quite an accomplishment. I'm sure he had stars in his eyes when this was happening. Um, unfortunately, three years later, when Mike is 17, I guess, um, his mom passes away, and D'Amato, who I guess has become kind of a father figure for him, becomes his legal guardian. Apparently, Mike's biological father was in the picture at this point. Um, and so um, not only is D'Amato his kind of manager and mentor and um, uh, in his professional side of his life, but it's more than that now. He is actually his parent. Um so um, then we have, again, let's go back to the, when Tom Mike is 15, um, D'Amato agreed with Rooney. So this is, again, this Cus D'Amato, who uh, is uh, kind of Mike Tyson's uh, ultimately legal guardian, but now at this point kind of his manager. He enters into a contract with Rooney saying, hey, Rooney, if you'll train Mike for free, um, um, then, you know, when he becomes professional, then there's going to be some money. Obviously, this for Rooney is, is kind of, you know, an investment. He's, you know, he's foregoing income, presumably. If D'Amato is picking him for this role, Rooney um, must be pretty good, a good uh, trainer. And so Rooney is going to forego income for, I'm guessing, years or at least many, many months. And, um, you know, there's always a possibility that Mike will not perform at the level they're hoping or he will lose interest or uh, perhaps he will get an injury that will make him um, unsuccessful. So uh, there's definitely some risk for Rooney, but Rooney says, no, I see the potential in Mike and I'm willing to defer this, um, this income for this future date. Um and then part of that agreement between Rooney and D'Amato, and of course when this is done, D'Amato is just his manager. He's not his dad or he's not his legal guardian at this point. Um, and so the agreement is Rooney would be Tyson's trainer for as long as Tyson fought professionally. So here they're deciding Mike's whole career when Mike is 14 years old and an amateur. Um, yeah, I don't know if Mike knew anything about this, but certainly... Um, he lacked the legal capacity to enter into such a contract, and who knows what his, his mom's level of knowledge of the situation was. So, let's go to the next slide. Okay, right, so Rooney trained Tyson for over two years without compensation. Then Mike turns professional. I guess he's, um, let me put back here in the timeline going. Okay, so he's 19 when he turns professional. D'Amato dies that same year. Um, of course, Mike at this point is legally an adult, so he doesn't have any guardians. And Jacob becomes 
Tyson's manager. So, Delano is out because of his death. Jacobs is now the manager, and Rooney is still the trainer. But a year later, Tyson terminates his training relationship with Rooney. And yet, Tyson continues to box professionally. So, from Rooney's perspective, Rooney breached, or I mean, Tyson breached the agreement that Rooney and D'Amato entered into those many years before. And of course, Rooney had relied upon that agreement when he was training Tyson for those 28 months. So, not surprisingly, Rooney sues Tyson for that breach of that oral contract between he and um, D'Amato. So, this is what the court did. The court decided that the length of time for performance of the contract was capable of being measured. Um, that that um, uh, the length of a professional boxing career is a measurable thing. The contract language was sufficient to support the conclusion that the employment was for a term, meaning a discrete length of time, and not merely at, ro- real, at will. So Rooney won. Now, would a Texas court go this way? Mm, I don't think so. I think the court would say no. We have people like uh, Muhammad Ali and George Foreman who were professional boxers for decades with other people in a much shorter period of time. Um, I think they would be much less likely to do that. My guess is that the New York court was swayed by the fact that it looked like Rooney had been taken advantage of. He had given up income for over two years, and now when Tyson's making some real money, and Rooney ought to be enjoying the, the fruits of that labor because, of course, his training presumably had gotten Tyson to that level of performance that he could, in fact, um, get the get the high uh, uh, prize uh, prizes for his, his boxing. That you know it seemed unfair. Um, so uh, one can see the idea behind the New York uh, court's decision. I'm not so sure that the Texas courts would go that way. Okay, um, so let's go on to Foley. This is a big case in California. Oh, so let's get into that slide here. Um, here we go. Okay, so this is um, uh, a, one of these cases that if you practice this area too much, especially if you do it in California, you will hear about this case. Um, and I've come to find the issue fairly extensively here because it's not the most straightforward issue. Remember I said before, before we go into this, that California's law is very different than Texas in this area. Um, so... What I'm going to be saying for the next few slides has almost no applicability in Texas. Um, as a result, um, this is kind of falls into the FYI category. I'm not going to test you over Foley directly. Um, but I think it's good to know um, where California is because, as I said before, you might have clients that have business in California. And even if you don't have that, many times what happens in California, you know, it starts there. Um, and then over time, it may move to other jurisdictions, become more uh, widely recognized. It could even become federal law. So it's good to know where California law is, if for no other reason than it might uh, point to some trends. But right here today, this is not Texas law. So it should assume that the state law does not recognize the cause of action for wrongful discharge. And obviously, Texas does not recognize the cause of action for wrongful discharge. That would be a just cause type category. Can the employee still assert that there is an implied contractual covenant of good faith and fair dealing that entitles the employee to be terminated only for cause? So the question is, is there kind of a uh, a backdoor way around this? Okay, we're not going to have this cause of action called wrongful discharge, which would actually be a tort type claim. Can we approach that same idea through a contractual idea? Because at will employment is a contractual relationship. I mean, yes, my boss can fire me at any time for no reason, good reason, bad reason. But while I'm employed, I'm entitled to compensation and I'm entitled to the deal that we've struck. I guess it could be ended at any time, but um, while it's going on, it's a contract. And so um, the issue is what kind of covenants, what kind of additional responsibilities are assumed into that agreement? Let me pause for a second and talk about. Uh, covenants of, of good faith and fair dealing. Where do you see things like that? I actually probably should have more fair dealing in there. Um, you find that in fiduciary relationships. You find that in contracts between um, 
accountants and clients, between um, lawyers and clients, between partners. So they're just assumed that you, uh, the, the, the accountant or the lawyer or the partner, whomever, um, has to, to not just meet the requirements that are specified in black and white in the contract, but also it's the spirit of the entity and the spirit of the relationship. The um, attorney has ethical obligations. The accountant has ethical obligations. But he also has more knowledge about the situation. And if he takes advantage of his client, when his client came to, he came to this legal professional to avoid being taken advantage of, you can see how uh, that it's been so implicit in the relationship that you need to have that. So the issue is, is that same idea, is the same obligation to say an attorney or an accountant owes to his client, do we find that in what an employer owes to an employee? And is that the type of, of duty that's going to result in the employee only being able to discharge, be discharged for cost? That's the question that we're going to answer. Let's look at the background facts. Let's look at Mr. Foley's circumstance. Because, you know, I'm going to be honest with you, he has a sad story. You know, when you hear the story, you're going to be like, oh, gosh, gosh, that's not too nice the way he was treated. And, and before, let, me, let me pause for a second. Before you hear a story, let me pause and, and tell you something that I will repeat uh, more than once, but I think it is useful uh, to hear now and, and then keep it in the back of your mind as you hear these stories. Invariably, in these cases, the court assumes the facts that are most positive for the plaintiff. So when they present the facts, what they are saying isn't so much, we know these to be the case. Well, it's more along the lines of, let's assume that the plaintiff's story is exactly the way things happen. Now, Interactive Data Corporation, which is really, I think, Chase in the story, um, they might well look at these facts and go, no, 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 that is nothing like what really happened. Um, this is Foley's creative imagination or something along those lines. So, um, be cautious when you hear these facts, because when you hear them, a lot of times you'll be thinking, oh, my gosh, what a horrible employer. And they may well have been. But be open to the possibility that there's another side of the story. And many times there's more than two sides of the story. So with that caveat, let's go through the facts. Okay, so Mr. Foley was employed by Chase, um, and he um, entered into some uh, contract confidentiality agreements. But these agreements did not seem to affect his at-will employment status. Um, he was well regarded, obviously. He became consultant manager of the year. He's promoted. So things are going well. Um, Chase seems to think he's all that. His, his salary is going up. Another indication that, that they, he's doing a good job, at least in the minds of the people in Chase. He received some bonus. Um, actually, he received a, 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 boat, a merit bonus payment two days before his discharge. Boy, that seems like a disconnect, doesn't it? Foley learned that his boss was currently under investigation by the FBI for embezzlement relating to the boss's former employment. Imagine if he finds out that his new boss is being investigated for what his new boss did at, his, at the boss's old place of employment. So, what does Foley do? Well, he does what any good employee would do, which would be to report this development to senior management. Of course, people at Chase are going to want to know that they may have an embezzler uh, that they just hired. At least it's worthy of an FYI. So, that's what Foley does. Um, but the senior manager doesn't seem to be receptive to that. He goes, oh, it's just rumors. Forget about what you've heard. Um, and so, um, the matter progresses. So, this is... Um, but in March, um, Foley was told that the bank had decided to replace him for performance reasons, that he could transfer to a position in another division in Massachusetts. Um, so he's having to move from California to Massachusetts. Um, he, he's not being fired, but this is not a good thing in his career. And it seems to have occurred on the heels of him uh, letting his, his higher-ups know about this this. Uh, scandal with his immediate supervisor. He was told that if he didn't accept this transfer to Massachusetts, he might be demoted, but he wasn't going to be fired. Okay, so that's the news that he got there. So he has a big decision to make. Let's see what happens next. And we'll see the story changes. Oh, no, one week later. Foley was told that he was not doing a good job, and six days later, Foley was told he could continue as breath manager if he agreed to go on a performance plan. Hmm. Okay. 
Next, the manager informed Foley that he had the choice of resigning or being fired. So for, forget about this performance plan thing. Performance plans typically last at least uh, several weeks, and, and uh, you know you wouldn't be immediately um, being told, okay, you failed. It. Well, no, that's not how that works. So, so now he has a choice of being, resigning or being fired. No option of demotion, no option of transfer, no option of performance plan. It's just out the door. Um, and so at this moment, so I guess Foley leaves. I'm not sure if he was terminated or if he resigned. But anyway, he sues for wrongful termination, claiming that the written termination guidelines applied not only to employees under Foley's supervision, but to him as well. You know, Foley was a supervisor, so he knew what the rules were about how he could treat employees under him. And he says, hey, I'm an employee too. Those rules that I was following with respect to my staff applied to me as well. And guess what? They didn't involve what the behavior that I'm seeing here. And he said that Chase officers made him repeated oral assurances of job security so long as his performance remained adequate. And this actually is not unusual. Um, how this happens. Imagine you go into your performance review, your annual review, and things are going well. And people say things like, well, oh, things are going great. We sure appreciate having you around. We, you know, we're just delighted with your work performance, and we just see everything is going great. And, and, and we hope you'll spend the rest of your career with us. Um, now, perhaps when that person said that, they're not thinking in terms of an oral contract. They are trying to encourage and, and um, compliment somebody and perhaps persuade him to continue for a period of time longer. Uh, but uh, you can see how that language could be interpreted by Foley, particularly after the fact, to um, to be a, 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 a just cause standard that is being applied to the circumstances. Okay, so we end up in the, ta- the California Supreme Court. And this is what the California Supreme Court did. It allowed Foley to continue with his contract claim that he could not be dismissed except for good cause. So those oral promises that he was saying, um, he would have the opportunity to present that evidence about that. But the California Supreme Court denied his claim for damages based upon an implied contract of good faith and fair dealing. The employer-employee relationship is not like the attorney-client relationship. There isn't that implied kind of fiduciary aspect where the employer has some obligation to um, treat the employee in a particularly um, uh, kind uh, uh, way. That's just not the basis. It's not the heart of the the arrangement. Um, California does not recognize the tort of tortious interference with an implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. And just a pause here. When you see the word tortious, that obviously you can see the, the base word tort. Um, one reason that plaintiffs love to make tort claims is that through a tort claim, the plaintiff has the possibility of getting punitive damages. Um, so it creates a greater potential for significant um, a jury verdict. And it also, because of this fact, increases the ability of the plaintiff sometimes to negotiate an advantageous settlement agreement in those circumstances. So plaintiffs like to allege that for very logical reasons. And of course, the defense bar, the employer bar, very much doesn't want tort claims to exist out there. They don't want the, the, the plaintiff to have um, ready access to a, a colorable, to a potentially valid tort, tort claim. So if they don't, you know, it's one thing to say you've got um, a, a contract claim out there because under a contract claim, you don't get punitive damages. It's a much more manageable set of risks that the um, employer faces. But when you throw out the word tort, um, you know, there's in some sense of uh, anything goes. And so um, this was good news for the uh, for the employment bar that California, which is generally considered one of the most liberal and one of the most pro-employee bars, is saying, no, we are not recognizing implied coming of good faith and fair dealing, can't get punitive damages, because, after all, this is a contract claim. The relationship between Foley and Chase is about an employment contract. Yes, you can breach an employment contract and you get contract breach damages, which don't extend to the tort damages such as punitive damages. Um, when you get into the area of tort, you need to show something more than you didn't do what you said you were going to do in the contract. And that's what the California court is talking about. 
And then a um, little bit update. In uh, 2000, the California Supreme Court held that if the employer emphasized the at-will nature of the employment, and the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing would not transform an at-will relationship into something else. So um, if there's um, a lot of mention about at-will employment, perhaps in the employee handbook, perhaps it's in the a job application form, perhaps it's in the annual appraisal form, those statements throughout the, the history of the employment relationship can be powerful indicia that, no, we are not going to go from at-will employment to some kind of just cause standard just because um, some things have been said orally or, or casually or have led to some kind of mis- miscommunication. Now, to say in Texas, you wouldn't really be able to stumble into something other than an at-will um, nature of the relationship. That, that's your default position. You have to, the employer and the employee have to work pretty hard to get out of the at-will um, aspect of the relationship, which is, which is different than California. But the takeaway here is, as you can see, it behooves the California employer who wants, of course, to maintain the at-will relationship to advertise it clearly in the employment handbook, in this form, in this form, in this form. And as a result, you will see that at-will language is, is pretty routine in lots of different places, um, not just in California, not just in states where um, but maybe the at-will status is a little bit more iffy, but um, also in, um, in states like Texas. Because for one thing, if you're a large employer, you have you standardize this stuff. You don't produce different versions for different states, usually, unless you're required to. Also, it's kind of the best practice. You know, why not level with your employee? Why not let them know what the relationship is from the get-go? I want to pause, and one thing I forgot to say about at-will employment that I should have mentioned by now is that at-will employment is a law in 49 of the 50 states. There is one state that does not have at-will employment. Kind of a surprise. You might have thought, well, New York or Wisconsin or Illinois or California, but no, it is the state of Montana. Um, not sure what the history behind why it's not at will employment, but it is the one state that isn't. So you may be thinking, well, that's weird that Montana has a completely different schema than we have in the other 49 states. That's not really true. Uh, Montana law is not at will employment, but the dis- Distinction between at will employment and um, the Montana situation, Montana legal environment is not particularly significant. There's some difference, but it definitely can be overblown. What happens is that when you are terminated in Montana, um, there is a somewhat different mechanism for applying for and collecting unemployment benefits than you find in the other states, and the benefits are somewhat richer. But really what you get in Montana is more unemployment benefits than you would in another state. And so let me pause for a second and talk about that. You know, I've been saying that we have at-will employment in all 49 and 50 states, and that's true. But unemployment insurance has really changed what that means. What is unemployment insurance? That is when um, an employee it, it loses his job involuntarily, typically, through no fault of his or her own, usually. They can apply for unemployment benefits. And the classic example of this is there's been a layoff um, because of economic downturn or maybe the employer has lost some business or the particular facility is closing. And so, therefore, through no fault of the employee, he or she is out of work. And he or she has paid in, the employer has paid in, typically the employer, um, but that can vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, has paid in... Um, to the unemployment fund, and it's an experience rating. So if, if I'm an employer and I um, rarely lay off people and, and don't terminate people unless there's very good cause, I'm going to have a low experience rating, just like if I am a, a car, car driver and I have auto insurance and I'm never in accidents and I never get speeding tickets, I'm very likely to pay lower annual premiums for my auto insurance than somebody who has a different experience rating. So. An employee, it behooves an employer to um, make sure that his experience rating for unemployment and benefits is as low as possible so that it can save money. And after all, it's a business. That's one of the goals to manage expenses. So um, uh, when the um, employee files a claim, the employer, if the employer has an argument available, would like to say, well, the reason why this employer is not working for me anymore is because of willful misconduct. Those are the key words that appear in most statutes, most state statutes. 
that the employer employee engaged in willful misconduct related to work. Examples would be the employee stole, the employee um, uh, missed several days of work without a reasonable excuse such as illness or something like that. The misconduct has to be misconduct. It's not simply he's not very good at his job or he's not the smartest person ever or he's not the most careful person. It's something beyond kind of the quality or quantity of work. It's pointing to something, you might even call it kind of misconduct, misbehavior. And then it has to be related to work. You know, the fact that the employee um, is cheating on his wife, well, that has nothing to do with work. Um, the employer might not, not think very highly of the employee for cheating on his wife, but since it's not related to work, it's really not a reason to terminate somebody. Now, all of this sounds like just cause, and it should sound like just cause. So the reality is the employer can terminate somebody um, under the at-will employment doctrine uh, without any uh, negative legal repercussions except for this unemployment insurance claim. And I say accept, but it's a huge issue. Employers work very, very hard to keep their rating low and to have as few incidents as possible under these circumstances because this is real money. And people, if they think they have a chance of winning employment, they're going to file for it. So um, in some sense, you could say all 50 states are no longer employment at will because of this unemployment insurance aspect. I'm going to call um, this session... I'm going to conclude this section at this point. We've gotten to the first 10 slides, and we have a total of only 53. <laughs> I'll have to go faster. I apologize. But this has gotten us started, talking some big things that we'll be um, seeing as we go forward in this chapter. Um, and I will continue with another presentation, um, which I will uh, send a posting when I have the next one done. I um, hope you have a good evening. I look forward to seeing you in class. Thanks so much for your attention.